excited about this episode because of my guest, Kristen Clark. Hi, Kristen. Hello. So excited to be here. Thank you so much for being here. You are from Texas in the US. That's why we're talking in English. And I'm sorry for my accent and grammar mistakes. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So um, would you like to introduce yourself and maybe your ministry because you are from yeah. Girl Define Ministries? Yes. So like you said, Kristen from Texas over here in the U.S. And yes, my sister and I started Girl Define Ministries back in 2014. So it'll be 10 years this year. And our passion from the beginning has been the same, which is to help women everywhere understand God's good design for their womanhood. So what his word has to say to us as women and how to live as godly women in this modern day and age, how to you know, and honor him in our relationships and what we view as successful, how we embrace our femininity, um, walking in a relationship with him, just everything that encompasses womanhood. So yeah, we're very passionate about that. And I'm very excited to have this conversation with you today. Yeah, me too. I feel like this is my fan moment. Could I, cause I no. <laughs> I've been following guys for several years. And I just oh. appreciate so much what you do. I think you do a really, really great job, an important job. And I know it's difficult to be out there to share the gospel, talk about biblical mm -hmm. womanhood. It's mm -hmm. super difficult and tough. But you guys are doing it, and I love that you're doing it. And yeah, so thankful for you. Oh, well, thank you for the encouragement. Yeah, and I, your English is very good. I'm very impressed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... My channel, Church Girl, is all about faith-based deep talk. And this is where we're heading today. It's going to be a deep talk, I think, because we'll be talking about when God doesn't answer your prayer the way you want him to. Yeah. And I think this is something that you really experienced, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, yeah, maybe we can just, yeah, talk about your story now. So... You had a big prayer request when you got married, right? Like you got married pretty young. Yes. Yeah, so I was 24, my husband was 23, and we got married. He's a wonderful, godly man. I was so thankful, grateful, still am for him to this day. But, you know, I remember walking down the aisle, getting married, and thinking, life just feels perfect. Like, we are so blessed. We have amazing Christian families right here in our city. I'm marrying this incredibly godly man. You know, life just seems perfect. We've got the Lord. Like, what could go wrong? You know, and little did I know that I would have an unanswered prayer, a longing of my heart that would stretch on for a decade of something that would become really hard, a journey that my husband and I would both walk through together. You know, on our wedding day, when you say your vows for better or for worse, you just kind of imagine the better. You know, life is just going to be better. And then when when it's not and really hard things happen, it really tests your faith and your trust in God and what you believe about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was your prayer request? What was on your heart at that time? Yes. So my husband and I, so I'm from a big family. There are eight kids in my family. He's from a, a smaller, normal family, three kids. <laughs> But he and I were both excited to start a family right away. You know, we were, we were just open to whatever the Lord would have for us. So we weren't doing anything to prevent pregnancy conception. And so of course, coming from a big family, I just thought, Oh, this is going to be so easy. We're just going to have kids right away. I'm going to be a mom, you know, probably within the next year or two. Um, and it's just going to be the, the continuation of this sweet, perfect story. So one year goes by two years go by and nothing. And I am, you know, I was really taken aback by that. And I was just thought, okay, well, you know, maybe we just need to try harder <laughs> or, you know, maybe we need to pray more. I'm not sure what's happening. And then right around our two year, right after we celebrated two years of marriage, I actually did get pregnant and we were so excited and we thought, okay, this is wonderful. The Lord just gave us time to establish a great foundation in our marriage. But, you know, now we're getting this, this answer to our prayers. We're going to finally have a baby. And six weeks later, very early on in the pregnancy, I miscarried and it was so sudden and so shocking and it wasn't something we were even thinking about as an option. We just thought, oh, we're pregnant and it's all going to work out. It's going to be perfect and beautiful. And so when I miscarried and it happened so fast, like all within a couple hours from start to finish of the bleeding. And so it was just very traumatic and, and fast and we just, we were kind of like, whoa, like our, our worlds were rocked. And so I just remember after that feeling like, God, what? 
why would you give us this beautiful gift only to take it away? That doesn't make any sense. You know what? Why give it to us in the first place? So just wrestling in my heart with the Lord. But at the same time, you know, I trust you, Lord, just steering my heart toward truth, looking in his word. My husband and I were praying a lot together as we were just grieving the loss. Um, but really asking the Lord to give us trust in him and his sovereign plan for our lives. And we thought, okay, it's just one miscarriage. It's very disappointing and we're grieving, but Lord willing, this won't happen again. So six months later, we get pregnant again and we're so excited and thought, okay, having back-to-back -back miscarriages is pretty slick. There's a slim chance. So we thought we're probably going to be fine. So I remember going into that second pregnancy so excited, but also a little bit hesitant to get too excited just because of the first miscarriage. Um, but still thinking like, there's no way we're going to miscarry again. Like that hardly ever happens two in a row. Um, but the same exact same thing happened exactly six weeks later, the bleeding, everything super fast. We miscarry. And it that time, that second time, it just really shook me in a deep way because I thought, okay, Lord, one, but now two back to back, like this isn't normal. What is going on? And why would you do this? So taking my wrestle and my, and even feeling some anger toward the Lord of why he would allow this to happen. Um, it was really putting to test my view of who God was. Cause I think as believers, as Christians, it's easy to view God as good when our life is good. And then when life is hard and filled with pain and sorrow, we contend the temptation is to then put that on God's character and to say, well, if you were good, you wouldn't do this. And so we start to view God's character through the lens of our circumstances rather than our circumstances through the lens of his unchanging character, right? He never changes. He's the same. Our lives change. We go up and down. So it's dangerous to do that. And I was, I was going that direction of really viewing God's character through the lens of my heart circumstances. And, and it was a tough season. I will tell you of just grieving and wondering what the future would hold. So very much, um, going through a lot and my husband and I, thankfully God allowed those trials to pull us closer together rather than you know, push us apart because we sought the Lord together. We grieved together. We really leaned in to what we were walking through as a team, which was huge for us, um, but still so hard. So that we were grieving, we're processing that. And I thought, okay, what's going to happen next? Like, I don't think I can keep doing this, just keep miscarrying. And so we did end up getting some some medical opinions and testing just to see if there could be something we don't know about and nothing really came back as a problem. And so we just thought, well, that's really weird. Like, why did that happen? And we didn't really have any answers. And so we were just told, yeah, just keep trying and we'll see what happens, you know? And so we thought, okay, we'll just keep trying and we'll probably get pregnant again and hopefully things will be different. Well, we didn't get pregnant two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. I mean, many, many years are going by and nothing's happening. And so that season for me of every year longing for pregnancy, that's where the prayer came in, where I was longing for this thing, crying out to God, and it just wasn't even happening. Now we weren't even having anything. Nothing was happening. And so it was in that season that I just felt God really pressing on my heart, where do I find my satisfaction? And my hope, is it in getting my prayers answered as a Christian? Is that really where my hope comes from? Or is my hope ultimately in the Lord, regardless of whether he ever says yes to this prayer? And it's really a theological question of what we believe at the core of our hearts of, do we actually believe that God is good and his plan is good? Even when he takes our life in a direction that we don't want, right? We're saying, Lord, I don't want this. I want something different. Please, would you hear my prayer? Do we trust him enough to follow him where he leads, not where we want to go? And that was hard for me because I thought I grew up in church. I, I had been a Christian since a very young age, walking with the Lord. And I thought for sure that my satisfaction was wholly 100% rooted in Jesus, you know, I was confident in that, but in this season of longing and waiting and not seeing my prayers get answered, I realized that I was putting a lot of hope and, and it's not wrong to hope, but I was putting a lot of my, like placing my satisfaction on getting that thing. You know, once I get that, then I'll be fully happy. You know, once I receive this answered prayer, then I'll really find contentment in the Lord. 
So it wasn't a true contentment like I thought I had. So the Lord did a lot of work in my heart in that season of just uprooting lies that I had been believing. So I don't know how much further you want me to go at this point. If you have questions, I could keep going in the story, but I want to give you a chance to jump in. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I know it is super personal and difficult to talk about things like that. So thank you. Um, so what do you say challenged you the most during that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, there were so many challenges. I think what I was just sharing was when you want something so bad, and it's a good thing, you know, I have so many friends who are longing for good things as well, longing to get married, um, similar as me, longing for children, longing for deep godly friendships, you know, things that the Bible says, these are good things to pray for and to long for when you have that tension of longing for something that is a good thing. And God isn't answering that prayer because his timing is different than ours. Then what do we do with that? And one of the analogies that I love that I used in our book, not part of the plan that my sister and I wrote together, um, is this example of imagine if you are looking at your whole life, you're looking at all the things happening, but you have to do it through a tiny straw. So imagine a little straw and you're looking through it and all you can see is just this tiny little circle through the straw of what's right in front of you. And that's all you can see. And And our vantage point, as far as like what we can see in our life is, is like a tiny straw. It's just a very tiny picture of what's really going on. But God, he's not looking through a straw, right? He sees everything, the past, the present, the future. He has a plan. He says in his word that he's working all things together for our good and his glory, including the hard and the grieving parts, the sad, the trials, all things. There's no disclaimer there. It's everything he's working for our good and his glory. And he sees the full picture. And so what I was challenged with, what was hard for me is, do I trust in what I can see, which is just this tiny little glimpse, or do I trust in my almighty God who is faithful and steadfast and good? Do I trust him and entrust my life to him, the God who sees everything and knows everything and promises that he's working it out for my good and his glory? Where am I going to place my trust? And it's really a choice. It's something that we have to choose to say, Will I trust in what I can see or will I trust in God who sees everything? So those were, that was one of the biggest things that God was really teaching me in that season. Mm -hmm. Wow. So good though. Yeah. Really, really mm -hmm. encouraging to hear that. I know it's difficult, but it's really encouraging yeah. to think about that and yeah, challenging. But what yeah. was the most encouraging thing? Maybe someone, mm. with your sister or parents or I don't know, your husband, someone who really encouraged you during yeah. that time. Yes. Well, I'm so thankful for godly husband, godly family, and then community. Um, there were other women at the same time who were walking through similar trials as I was, um, just infertility, the longings of unanswered prayer, and then women who had different trials that were similar in the fact that they were unanswered prayer. So I'm very thankful to have had a mentor, which is something that I here at Girl Defined, we are passionate about the Titus II model of older women discipling and mentoring younger women because of the impact. One, it's God's design. It's a beautiful design that older godly women would pour into younger women. Um, and so leaning into that, I actually found a mentor, a lady that I knew in my community. She's a, an older woman, godly. And I just remember one day it struck me like, I want to ask her to be my mentor, which is a scary thing to do because you don't know if they're going to say yes, or I'm too busy or what, but I prayed about it. And I just said, I'm just going to reach out and leave the rest to God. And I did. And she's, she got back to me a couple days later and said, I would love to mentor you. And so having a mentor, someone that you can share your deepest struggles with someone that you can go to and say, would you please pray for me? I'm really struggling right now, or I'm wrestling with this in my walk with God right now. Do you have any wisdom, anything from the word, from your experience, from your journey with the Lord, um, anything you can encourage me in? And she was just amazing. Um, there were some pivotal points that she stepped into my life in some of those, in that season, that was really hard. And she would just open the word and take me to the word and just show me God's faithfulness. Show me, um, not just saying you can't trust the Lord, but why I could trust the Lord. Like, let's look at his character together. Let me show you. And it was just so encouraging. So that would be, that was probably outside of my husband who was so just such an anchor for me. Um, he's very steady in his emotions and his personality, a very faithful. And I can tend to be like a typical woman, very 
up and down <laughs> like a roller coaster in my emotions. So one moment I'm doing great and the next moment I'm doing terrible. And so having a steady husband was a huge blessing to this day. I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> so I would say having a mentor and if anyone's listening and they're like, wow, having a godly older woman in my life would be amazing, but I just don't even know how I could do that. Who could I ask? My encouragement would be to just start praying. Pray that God would provide a godly older woman for you. And then as you're praying for days, for weeks, open your eyes and look around and ask God to help you see maybe a woman that you already know who could be in your community or even someone you know that you could have a long distance you know, with technology, we can do all sorts of things. So a long distance call with even, you know, once a week, once a month uh, to pray, ask God to bring someone to mind. And then when he does to step out in faith and do the scary thing of asking that woman to mentor you, because that can be one of the biggest, most impactful, life-changing tools that God can use to grow us as younger women um, in our walk with him. So that was a huge, that was a huge thing for me. Oh, that's great. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then after all those difficult years, God finally answered your prayer, but in a different way. Wow. Yes. Well, I know it's, it's just yeah. such a God story because I never would have imagined this ending. Um, yeah. So we, there was one more really, really hard part though in the story. And that is around eight years of our marriage. I did get pregnant again out of the blue right after I had had a surgery for something else. And it was so shocking. And that pregnancy actually lasted longer than the first two. So we were at 11 weeks pregnant when, you know, when everything seemed to be going well, we had a strong heartbeat at the eight week ultrasound. And I just thought, this is a miracle. We're pregnant and things are working. And then at 11 weeks, we went back in to see my doctor and I had the ultrasound thinking, you know, everything's probably going to be fine. And I just, I write about this again and not part of the plan. She just got really quiet. And, you know, when the doctor gets really quiet and doesn't say anything for a few, you know, seconds, you're kind of like, and she just looked at me and said, I'm so sorry, but there isn't a heartbeat anymore. And in that moment, it was like, it felt like a knife had stabbed my heart. And my husband was there and he just grabbed my hand and I just sat, laid there in shock like what? There is no heartbeat. I couldn't even process the information, you know, which she's saying you're the baby's not alive anymore. And in that moment, I, I just, yeah, it was just shock. And my husband held my hand and I just laid there and I just silent tears were just flowing from my eyes. And that was more challenging. I would say for sure by far than even the first two miscarriages, because we had allowed ourselves to hope again, um, because things seemed like they were going well. And so when that happened, that was probably afterward one of the lowest points in my life spiritually of all the things that I thought I had learned, all of the things that I was seeking to trust the Lord in and surrender and find contentment in him alone. It just all kind of came crashing down. And I remember thinking like, what is happening to my faith? Like how, like surely I can be stronger than this. Um, but it was just such heavy grief for my husband and I. And again, he was such an anchor, very steady and strong through helping us grieve together. Um, but I was at such a low place that I didn't even know how to pray. I was like, I don't even know what to say. I don't even really want to pray. I don't even really want to read my Bible. Like I just, I was like, I, I just feel so... I'm just so grieved by this that I don't even want to talk to God is how I felt. And I had never actually felt that way before. And so the thing that turned it around for me was I knew that I had to get truth into my heart. I was like, my heart and my mind, I am grieving, but I am also struggling to believe what's true, what I know is true. And so what I did is I just found a 30 day little study on the names and attributes of God. And every day I would read one verse that talked about God's character or a name of God mentioned in the Bible. And there was a tiny little snippet, like a little small paragraph about that. And then I would just pray that God would help me to believe what he says about who he is, about his character, about his names and what they mean. And it was just w literally one day at a time, one step at a time until after the 30 days, God used that to renew my heart. It, it was like I was in a dark pit and just slowly, one step at a time through his word, he brought me out of that. So 
that is that tool was amazing in fact we created something that we give away for free here at girl define that is a similar kind of a a, sh- a pared down version of that but if anyone listening just goes to girldefine.com slash god girldefine.com slash god you can download a 30-day praying through the names and attributes of god it's just one sheet pdf you can get it for free because I was like, everyone needs this. This was so helpful for me. So there you go. So that happened and a year goes by and my, you know, we don't get pregnant two years and we're just like, you know, maybe the Lord has different plans for us. And the Lord started stirring in my heart first, this thought of adoption. And over the years, we had had so many people just lovingly say, you know, would you guys consider adoption? You would be great parents. You know, you guys should adopt and just comments. And we had prayed about it. We really had. But it just the timing never felt right. We just never felt like the door was opened or God was really moving us in that direction. And what we didn't want to do was try to jump into something just to fix our problem. Like, well, God's not giving us children. We'll just adopt and fix the problem. We really wanted to make sure that our hearts were in the right place, that we were doing it for the right reasons and that we were following the Lord and not just jumping ahead and trying to fix something. And so the Lord just kind of started pressing on my heart just in the quiet moments of my day, just this thought of adoption and, and kind of getting, stirring up this excitement in me. And I shared it with my husband and he was like, okay, yeah, like I'm open, let's talk. And I ended up coming across a book called Adopted for Life by Russell Moore. And it was that book completely changed my perspective. And same for my husband. We both read it within like a week. And basically he's just presenting adoption as this beautiful option where adoption is so much more than just taking in an orphan or a child in need of a home. But it's this picture of the gospel of how Christ has adopted each one of us into his family. We're the orphans. He's the one who brought us in, who gives us a new name, a new identity. Um, We become a part of his family and how earthly adoption is such a beautiful picture of the gospel lived out in many ways. And I just had never seen it that way or thought about it that way. And then in the book, he just talks about a lot of practical hurdles and challenges couples face when adopting and kind of how to work through them. He had adopted, he and his wife, a couple, a couple boys. And so my husband and I, after that, were just like, wow, yes, we want this. Like we're actually excited about this. And so we were praying about what that could look like. Do we adopt a baby locally? Do we adopt abroad? Older kids, younger kids? We didn't know. We were open to whatever God would have for us. And at the time, One of my sisters, I have four sisters. One of my sisters was actually in a long distance relationship with a missionary from Ukraine. And so this is back in like 2020, like in the middle of the pandemic or right before it started. And so she and this, this man who is Ukrainian, he's from Ukraine, they started dating and we ended up taking a trip over there during their relationship. And we just got to know the country of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine and through my sisters, then he became her fiance and then they got married and she moved over to Ukraine with him. And through that, just that connection, we really just got stirred in our hearts, I guess, a love for Ukraine and an an interest in Ukraine that had never been there. And so we started looking into Ukrainian adoption stuff and one thing led to another, led to another. It was like God was just opening every door, like where we had felt like things were not opening in the past. It was so clear that he was leading us down this path. And so long story short, he opened up the door for us to adopt two boys who are biological brothers. And they were at the time, this was back in 2021, they were 10 and six. So older kids, you know, not like little toddlers or little babies, but like older kids. And we, we were just like, yes, we want to do this. We never imagined that we would be one adopting and then adopting a sibling group of boys who are older, but it was the most precious and sweet thing. So we flew over to Ukraine. We met them after we did like a year of paperwork. It's very long process, Uh, but we persevered. Yeah, it's just, I'm glad. I mean, they, you have to do a lot of things to even get approved for adoption and then to adopt internationally. It, it was very complicated, but we had a great agency. They helped us through the whole process and we just continued to seek the Lord. Um, but it was just so sweet to see how he brought us and these two precious boys brought us together to create a new family. So we flew over once, met them, did a bunch of paperwork, and then flew over a second time. And that's when we actually got to bring them home with us. So it was two trips. Um, so the second trip, bringing them home was just, it was amazing. And they 
really connected with us right away. We connected with them right away. It was just such a sweet bond that God provided, which was a huge prayer request was that God would just unite us as a family and give us that bond and that connection. And he did in such a deep and beautiful way. So we brought our boys home and they could not speak any English and we could not speak any Russian or Ukrainian. And so it was a big learning experience, but for all of us, God, just so many sweet moments and provisions from the Lord, even in that. Um, he's just so good and so faithful. And for me, after all those years, just to for God to answer the cry of our heart, which was we just long to be parents and for him to provide that through these two precious boys to provide a family for them and bring us all together. It was just such a God thing and something, like I said earlier, I would have never imagined that's how the ending would turn out, but I, would, I wouldn't change it you know, for anything through even the ups and downs, the heartache, the grief. He's taught us so much and we know that he's good and that he has a plan and purpose. Even if we can't see, we can't see all the pieces. We don't know exactly what he's doing um, but we know what's true for today. And that is that we are now parents to these two precious boys and we'll be a family. We call it Clark Day, the day that we became a family, when we all became Clarks together, because that's our last name. And he that'll be coming up in, in a couple months. And so just the celebration of that, the sweetness of the Lord's provision. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I think there's so many more questions. <laughs> but it's a whole story in your book, right? The one you already talked. Yes. Yes, not part of the plan. Um, we were actually finishing writing that book as we were finalizing the adoption. So it was all kind of happening at the same time. So I write about the adoption, but I could only get so far in the story because it was happening <laughs> in that moment. But yes, all of the, everything leading up to that, to the point of the adoption, so many more things that God taught me, lots of specific scriptures. If you're like, I want to know more, not part of the plan would be a great resource for that. Okay, so if you guys are interested in hearing more about this story, just grab the book. <laughs> yeah. All right. I really want to honor your time. That's why I think we should, yeah, kind of close this conversation. But I have one last question. Um, so looking back now, what would you like to tell other women who struggle with infertility mm -hmm. or other mm -hmm. struggles, whatever it is? Um, so what yeah. would you tell them? I would tell them a couple things. One, don't walk the journey alone it can feel very isolating because there aren't a t you know there are a lot of women who are walking the journey of infertility but there are way more women who aren't right so it can feel like i'm the only one and i remember feeling that many times and so don't walk it alone even it doesn't mean you have to surround yourself with a support group of women who are going through the same thing or find a friend who's in the same struggle what i mean by that is find someone who can walk alongside you as a christian woman struggling with an unfulfilled longing and so like i said for me that my mentor was a huge part of that she wasn't hadn't struggled with infertility herself but she was a godly woman who was able to take me and my wrestling heart to the word and to listen to my struggles and to pray with me through them so don't walk it alone don't wrestle with your struggles and um yeah just don't do it alone that's where the enemy i think gets us is when we put ourselves on an island in the sense that we just think i'm the only one no one can understand and we don't share we don't listen to what god says in galatians where he talks about bear one another's burdens he wants us as believers to walk in community with one another and that includes sharing our burdens with other believers and welcoming the support that the lord would provide through that community so that would be one huge thing and then the other thing i would just encourage any woman struggling with is um, get not part of the plan because I think that'll be really encouraging for you. Um, but just remember that God is good and that he is trustworthy, that your struggles, he sees them. He is not unaware of them. He knows exactly what he's doing and as hard and as painful as it is, because I know you can trust him and you can place your trust in the God that sees all things rather than what you can see. And you can trust that whether he ever gives you biological children or not, this side of heaven, um, that his plan is ultimately for your good and for his glory. So striving to live a life that is rooted in glorifying God as your greatest purpose, not becoming a mom, not having this perfect family, not even getting married. Your greatest purpose is to glorify God. And you can do that regardless of what season you're in, what unfulfilled longings you have. God wants to use you to glorify him and he can do that if you surrender and trust him with your life amen such beautiful words thank and, you um, 
yeah, maybe you can just share where the people can find you. So on socials, your books. Yes. Yeah, so we are on all the socials. So if you just look up Girl Defined on any platform, you'll find us. And then our website is girldefined.com. Girldefined.com. I want to mention that free resource again, girldefined.com slash God, just G-O-D at the end, um, as a great tool for anyone struggling with any sort of unfulfilled longing. I think soaking in who God is can be an incredible just encouragement to our hearts. So yeah, any social media platform or just check us out at girldefined.com. Yeah, that's great, guys. Just do it. <laughs> Go follow Girl Define. Check out the resources. They're great. Um, yeah, and thank you again so, so much for your time, for being here, for sharing your story. It was such, such a wonderful time with you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was my privilege.